Welcome back to another episode of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures League. We're presented by 78 Sports and happy opening week of baseball. The Division I season starts on Friday, February 16th. We're extremely excited to have baseball back. You notice that I am solo this week as Matt Ferreira is preparing for his Emerson baseball season. He will be back for the next episode. Uh, We wish Matt and the Emerson Lions the best of luck as their season begins oh so soon. We have some Futures League news before we get into the specifics of this episode. The Worcester Bravehearts are staying in Worcester, but they are under new ownership. John Creedon sold the Worcester Bravehearts to Frank Vaccaro and his family. We welcome the Vaccaro family to the Futures League, and the Worcester Bravehearts want you to know that they're not going anywhere. They're sticking at Fitton Field at Holy Cross and are ready for another fun summer in the Futures League. Additionally, the Norwich Unicorns, the hosts of the 2024 All-Star Game, announced their plans On Monday, July 22nd, will be a first responder game as well as the home run derby accompanied by some live music afterwards. And Tuesday night will be the all-star game. It will feature batting practice, scout day, and of course, post-game fireworks. You can't have a good all-star game without some post-game fireworks. Tickets go on sale February 29th. That information is all on our social media, so be sure to check that out. This week, however, on the Back to the Futures podcast, we have two guys who are staples in the baseball writers community. We have Dan Guttenplan of the New England Baseball Journal and Peter Flaherty of Baseball America, two guys that know New England baseball inside and out. They've covered the Futures League. They've covered New England schools like BC, Northeastern, UConn. They're following all of the pro prospects that have come through New England and specifically the Futures League. We get into all of those schools, most of those players, And we also dive a little bit into their backgrounds in journalism and what it's like covering these guys in college and in the pros. It's a really great episode and a really good way to kick off the baseball season here in New England. It all starts Friday, February 16th. Division one baseball is back. Baseball is back. We can feel it in the air and the futures league is oh so close. We want to get you to this interview, though, and enjoy it. It's a great episode. Here is Dan Guttenplan and Peter Flaherty. We are honored to be joined by our next guests here on Back to the Futures, celebrating the opening week here in college baseball. We've got Peter Flaherty from Baseball America and Dan Guttenplan from the New England Baseball Journal. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? And thank you so much for coming on. Thank, Thanks for having me. I'm doing really well, as we talked about before we hit record, just gearing up for the college baseball season and it's sure to be another uh, really exciting year. Yeah, I feel the same way, Owen. Thanks so much for having me. And um, yeah, I'm excited for the college baseball season. It's nice to have stuff to write about other than just kind of projecting what's going to happen. Yeah, we actually get to see those projections come to life on Friday as the college baseball division one season gets underway. And Guys, I know a lot of people that are following this podcast have likely read your stuff, but maybe not met the two of you and kind of know your journeys. So, uh, Peter, I want to start with you, then we'll go to Dan. If you guys don't mind just introducing yourselves, kind of giving the audience a little background about how you got to covering college baseball. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I so I grew up playing. I played through high school. I went to the Belmont Hill School. Um, I kind of found out pretty quickly that I wouldn't be good enough to play in college. So I wanted to stay involved in the game, um, as much as I could. And throughout my time on the Cape, I grew up going there, um, during the summers when I was a kid and throughout my time there, I was, I became really close with coach Roberts, coach Mike Roberts with the Katua Ketaliers. And he kind of led me towards the GM intern MLB scout liaison role with the Ketaliers. And so I always kind of kept that in my back pocket throughout high school. And when I got to college, I applied for the position and was a, was fortunate enough to get it. And I did that for a couple of summers before I got a call from the Northeast area scout and Northeast area supervisor, Matt Hyde of the New York Yankees asking me to be his associate scout, which is basically just an extra set of eyes around the Northeast um, with the Yankees. And I was thrilled beyond belief. And I, I jumped at the opportunity and I, I helped him out for a, a couple of years and helped the Yankees out for a couple of years. And then last fall, I, I was presented with an opportunity from Baseball America and I threw my hat into the ring and, and was fortunate enough to, to earn that role as well. So it's a very brief snapshot into how I got involved covering college baseball, but 
long story short, I've, I've been a fan of it for as long as I can remember. And I'm really fortunate enough now to be, to be able to cover it on a national scale. Yeah, I had a, a similar background in terms of playing as uh, Peter. I played, I grew up, it was my favorite sport to play. I loved watching it. You know, I watched games every night with my dad. Um, I got recruited to swim in college uh, at University of New Hampshire. So I went up there, did that for four years, and then kind of stuck around in the uh, North Shore, Merrimack Valley area. I, I was living around Boston for a while and then kind of moved once I had kids up to the North Shore, Merrimack Valley, I kind of went the traditional newspaper route. Um, I was covering a lot of high school sports, uh, and then I became a sports editor. And we were tracking guys that were, you know, D1 prospects and went off and played in college, but we weren't, I wasn't really on a college baseball beat. Uh, and then I started with base, uh, New England Baseball Journal. Uh, I started writing for them probably in like 2015. I came on as the um, the editor of New England Baseball Journal in 2020. And then um, it's just a great, a great area to cover college baseball with um, all the, you know, D1, really good D3 programs, D2 also very strong with uh, Southern New Hampshire and Franklin Pierce kind of leading the way. And then, you know, the summer, it's great. It's, you know, the, some of the best collegiate summer leagues are in the New England area. So it's been great. I'm, I'm loving it. And I can't wait for it to get started on Friday. Yeah, we are really excited to have baseball in this area again. And we are going to get into the specifics of the New England teams, but I do want to touch on something something that Dan mentioned, and that is the summer leagues. You know, the reason that we are here talking about baseball and specifically our league, the Futures League. What have you guys seen from the Futures League and I guess summer baseball in general and how it's helped college kids progress in their baseball careers? I mean, I, I think it's incredibly valuable, whether you're playing in the Futures League, the NECBL, the Cape League, and, and any of the leagues around the country. I think it's so valuable for your development, and you're able to both develop your skills as a player and form bonds with other guys around the country, and, and you're surrounded by really high-quality coaching staffs, and, and you get to play against high-quality competition almost year-round. Uh, you take the fall out of it in the winter, especially for these New England guys, but um, from February through August, you are playing against um, some of the best players in the country, and it is um, just just incredibly valuable, both um, experience-wise on the field and also off the field, because you hear so many times of guys talking about uh, memories that they made in, in the Futures League and the NECBL and the Cape long past their playing days um, collegiately and even into their pro days. So I, I think it's super, super valuable. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's valuable for almost every level of college baseball player. When you think about it, uh, February to August is basically a full a full baseball season. So when, you know, the highest of high college prospects, they need to get those innings. They need to get um, those reps and play a full season. So what they're when they're drafted, they're ready to uh, to play, you know, 120 games or, you know, throw 150 innings. So it just extends the season for those guys, for the guys who may – not have, you know, as um, I guess a high profile role on their college teams. It gives them an opportunity in the summer to kind of reset and say, hey, maybe I'm hitting in the middle of the order for my summer collegiate league team. Maybe I'm having more of an opportunity to showcase my skills in front of scouts. And now, you know, with the transfer portal, a lot of these guys are getting a chance to play in front of college coaches and show them what they can do in the summer in case they're in the transfer portal and want to get another opportunity. And then, you know, what I really love about the Futures League is that incoming freshmen get a chance to play. So, you know, you sent us over some um, pro prospects that have come through the Futures League. And it's a lot of those guys that maybe just missed getting drafted out of high school or some of them do get drafted, but they're not in the top couple of rounds. So they end up going to college. But it's just a high level of um, prospect that comes through in their incoming freshman year and, you know, I did a story with um, Northeastern in the fall, and I remember Mike Glavin saying, like, those are important at-bats and important innings for incoming freshmen. He's using those to evaluate how he's going to make his lineup going into the fall season, how he's going to set his rotation. So it's it's hugely important, and um, it's fun to watch, too, because you see a lot of guys break out in the summer that maybe had quiet springs. Yeah, it's great to see, and we'll touch on uh, the specific schools um, here in a second, but – you know, it's great to get that perspective from you guys, which, you know, we always get players and stuff on here, but it's nice to have the media side on on here. Um, but Dan, you mentioned Northeastern. That's among the many teams that you guys are tasked with covering for baseball schools around New England, BC, 
be uh, UMass among them, UConn. Um, but let's get into the specifics. You mentioned Northeastern. They're nationally ranked. They come, they're come. they coming in at number 23 heading into the season. What is Why is this team nationally ranked? Let's. What are the best names on the roster that teams should be looking for, and what makes them so good? Well, uh, Mike Sirota is a, a potential – I mean, he's, he's a first-round pick, I think. He's probably a lock to go in the first round. I remember um, Peter and I did a podcast – couple of months ago and he talked to, uh, about him as a potential number I don't know if he'll go number one overall but he's that kind of guy he's a five tool player you know his recognition of the strike zone is just elite um, and then they got a lot of guys who are just really good contributors to you know high-end D1 roster Tyler McGregor's had success both at Northeastern and on the Cape I think he came from Columbia um as a transfer he's really good alex lane i think is a preseason all-america cam maldonado and avon cabral both uh preseason or last year they were um freshman all-america selection so avon cabral is probably their friday guy going into the season he's got a really good arsenal of pitches cam maldonado um you know was super productive as a freshman he could be a guy that sits in the middle of that order and uh produces runs and then Harrison Feinberg look out for him he could be a good guy this year to kind of take that next step and produce a lot of runs for them but I know Peter's excited about more Northeastern too they have um Wyatt Scotty back just a quiet you know under the radar guy who has had three really productive years at Northeastern I, he probably goes into the season with close to 20 wins um for his career he's an he's a really good prospect uh who could be like a day two day three guy but um, yeah, I know Peter's just as excited as I am about Northeastern this year. Yeah, I, I think you summed it up perfectly. Uh, it, they they return a ton from last year's team. Um, they won a program record 44 games last year and appeared for regional, appeared in a regional for the second time in three years. Like you said, it starts with Sirota and you hit on the key contributors. Um, but I think a couple of guys that I'm really excited to watch, one is, is Dennis Collarn, who's also a Futures League guy. Um, they have him back and finally healthy uh, after he missed all of last year. He's got a great sinker slider combo. He's going to, I mean, he's going to be one of the best relievers in the conference and and be, be able to anchor the back end of the bullpen. Jack Goodman's another futures league guy. He transfers in from Pepperdine. He's a shorthanded defender on the infield. Um, if he can produce offensively, that is going to be incredibly valuable for that lineup. You mentioned that stable of arms they have. I, I really like that rotation because it's, it's guys that really know how to pitch. They're strike throwers. Nothing they really throw is super straight, um, and they and they get guys out and avoid hard contact. They're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then also, it, it starts at the top with with head coach Mike Glavin. Um, he's as outstanding a human being as he is a baseball mind, and he gets every single guy on that roster year in and year out to to buy in and play for each other. And they're kind of the embodiment of. Northeast tough, so to speak, no pun intended. And they're a super, super great team that is there. I, I think they're going to make a ton of noise this spring and they have the upside to make a college world series run. Yeah. Northeastern it's an incredible team. And, you know, we've had Mike Lavin on this podcast and the way that he thinks and he creates the, that roster and that team is, is something special. And you mentioned a ton of guys that, um, that you listed off are from the futures league, which is great. Uh, Dan, I do want to reference an article that you wrote about Northeastern and specifically there was a section there about the futures league, how Glavin likes to send these guys, especially incoming freshmen to the futures league to get reps. How important is that when you're talking to him about that and the players about that and how they feel coming out of the futures league? Oh, hugely important. I think, you know, it's difficult to know uh, everybody and what level of competition they're playing against at the high school level. I mean, now prep has certainly gotten very uh, competitive and you see a lot of D1 arms, a lot of D1, you know, position players at that level. But you're not going to see it like you do in the Futures League where you have guys who have played at the college level two, sometimes two or three years. Uh, they know how to get outs. So it's not just fastball, fastball. I'm going to blow you away with, you know, 92 all day. A lot of times you're seeing guys um, who have three or four pitches and, and you have to learn to identify those pitches and you need to go through those struggles too and understand like, hey, I'm not going to hit 600 for a season in college like I did in high school. So it's it's important to kind of go through those highs and lows, learn the routine, see how other guys uh, prepare 
you know, that's another good thing to do as you're heading into college. It's not just show up and play. It's, hey, who's starting today? What's their arsenal of pitches? You're playing against even competition. And I know Mike Lavin, he's looking at stats. You know, he, he's getting out to see these guys a little bit, but he's looking, hey, did did somebody hit 350 in the Futures League? That's that's huge. That shows us they're ready to go. They're ready to play in the Colonial Athletic Association. So he's using it as an evaluation tool. And then also, you know, the college season is such a grind. It's good to get those extra at-bats. It's good to kind of build up your stamina for a season where it's going to be four hard at bats every game. It's not, you're not going to just step up there, you know, swing it, strike one and end up on second base. It's a, it's a grind. And he likes to kind of get that started before the freshman, the, the fall of the freshman year. Yeah. And you talk about the grind of the college season and, but talk about the grind of the summer. It's, you know, it's 60, 60 plus games pretty much every day. And you said four or five at bats a day, or if these guys are pitching, it's every four or five days. It's, it's, it's a lot, but we've seen a lot of Northeastern talent come through the league that have excelled for sure. Yeah. And it's, and it's tough outs. You know, you'll hear that from high school guys all the time, guys who throw, you know, 90, 91 in high school and they can get through innings and in eight or nine pitches. And then they go to the uh, futures league and the, it's, it's a grind. You're it's tough to get outs. You know, even if you're getting to the bottom of the order and these guys are still fouling off tough pitches and uh, you have to get used to that, not get frustrated and keep your composure and really say, hey, there are going to be struggles and it's going to be hard. And if I want to get to where I'm going to get, I'm going to have to persevere through this. Yeah, they, there's definitely been some persevering, but um, it, it was great to see all those guys come through the league and some of them even win championships with the league. So they've certainly made their mark. Um, and another school that has made their mark is BC, who was very good last year, nearly hosted a regional um, they've got a new coach now as Mike Gambino is off to Penn State. Uh, what are you guys thinking about them heading into the year and how do they build off last year? Yeah, I mean, last year they appeared in the tournament for the first time since 2016. I know being a Boston guy, and I'm sure Dan feels the same, it was so much fun to to follow them and kind of root them on a little bit um, throughout their run. And it was, I, I, I was pretty surprised quite frankly, that they didn't end up hosting, um, but it was still a, a successful season. They got a regional win down there in Alabama um, in the Tuscaloosa regional. I think heading into this year, um, there's a lot to replace from last year. Um, they're going to be without Joe Vetrano, Travis Honeyman, two of their most productive hitters, and then on the mound, um, they're going to have to replace that anchor on Friday nights, and, and Chris Flynn and Henry Leak also graduated. Um, Julian Tangini, who is a good bullpen piece, transferred to Indiana. So there's a lot to replace, um, but they do have a good core of guys that are coming back. And I think it starts on the mound again um, with another Futures League alum and John West. And he's someone that could have absolutely signed if he wanted to and begun his professional career. But he opted to return to BC, 6'8 righty, um, exciting arsenal. And he's, I, I think he's a great guy to get the ball on Friday nights and then joining him in the rotation on Sundays is going to be Tyler Mudd, who's also a Futures League guy and a fellow Worcester Braveheart. Um, he's a, a lefty strike thrower, uh, pitch ability guy. He had a, a really good summer, most notably in 2022 in the NECBL, where he had a, I think it was a 0 0.3 ERA in 30 innings. And he had a solid summer last year on the Cape and also again in Worcester. So he's a He's someone that they're going to rely on heavily. And then up the middle, Sam McNulty, who I sound like a broken record. He played for Nashua, the Silver Knights in the Futures League. He'll be the everyday shortstop. Um, and there, there's another, there are a few more guys that, that are kind of going to make up that core. Joey Ryan in the bullpen is, uh, he's he's a very good guy to have closing games for you. I think he's got the best changeup in the ACC. He showed really well on the Cape. Um but I, I, I think with all of that being said, it'll be a little bit of a year of growth for the Eagles. I think it'll be it, – it's hard to ask them to replicate what they did last year, um, even with what they have coming back. But there is a lot to replace. They're going through a coaching change. But I will say that I think Coach Interdonato was more than a slam dunk hire for Boston College. I think that while it might not be this year or next year – He's eventually going to turn them into a perennial regional contender. He's an outstanding recruiter. He is extremely well respected in the baseball world. And he knows how to build up a program and make them a consistent winner. And he did it at Wofford. And I have no doubt that he will do it at BC and he'll be able to excel with the resources that he has. 
Yeah, I agree. I, I talked to Coach Interdonato a few times. I've been impressed um, just in my interactions with him. I felt like when Coach Gambino left, it was going to be a tough situation for whoever stepped into this job in year one. Um, and he's managed to do a pretty good job of keeping it all together. Uh, you mentioned John West. He was in the transfer portal um, and he ended up staying at BC, which is a huge uh, kind of non-move for BC to bring him back. Uh, a key piece is Sean Hard. I mean, he's got the stuff. He can throw 95, 96. If he can step up and have a meaningful role this year, either as a starter, you know, they've talked about maybe using him in the back of the bullpen. They really need him to kind of do what he did on the Cape last summer and uh, have that transfer to the ACC. Um, but they've got some production returning. Barry Walsh has had a good college career. It's almost surprising that he's returning to BC for another year because he's had a lot of production. He's got a lot of tools. I would almost have expected him to go pro after last year. Cam Leary, you know, he strikes out a lot, but he's also, you know, he hits home runs and drives in runs. So he's a good player. N Nick Wang, another good one. Um and he's a he's a local guy. He's from Newton, and I think he played at BBNN or yeah, I think he was at BBNN. Um, and then Kyle Wolf is a guy who's going to see more time, you know, as a either a first baseman or third baseman this year. He's going to be in a corner infield spot. But yeah, I like I like BC's chances. to kind of I don't think it's going to be a collapse. You know, I think Coach Interdonado kept everybody there. Adonis Guzman transferred to Arizona. He was their only transfer. But he might have transferred anyway without a coaching change because he was kind of stuck behind Peter Burns last year. And I think he was looking for a full-time opportunity behind the plate. Um, so BC, you know, Coach Interdonato kind of kept it together as best you can after a coaching change, uh, you know, coming off a 37-win season in the ACC. And um, like Peter said, maybe they take a, take a small step back because of the ACC. It's so hard to have consistency. Um, but, you know, I, I like – where that coach inner Donato has kind of held it all together here uh, with a little bit of uh, transition in the last six months. Yeah. You never know what's going to happen with a coaching change, but um, as you said, they kept a lot of core guys there. You mentioned John West, Pat, um, Sam McNulty, mud, Kyle Wolf. They're, they're in, they're in good shape heading yep. into the year. We'll, we'll see what happens though. Um, as you know, you don't know yet. You don't know what inner Donato has got in them, but we'll of see course, what happens yeah. there. And then speaking of transfers, it seems like the transfer hub of the Northeast might be the Yukon Huskies. They, it seems like every Futures League player ever transfers there, but uh, they had another successful year last year. A couple of new transfers from the Futures League, including Caleb Spur and Matt Malcolm, and previous transfers, including uh, Luke Broadhurst, Ryan Daniels, Jake Studley, among others. What are you guys seeing from the Yukon Huskies this year, and how do you like their chances? I, I think it's always hard to bet against UConn, um, especially with Coach Penders at the helm. And they lose they lose some production from last year with, um, I believe, Dominic Freeberger and Ben Huber both um, graduating. But Paul Tamaro's back. Jake Studley's back. Um, I believe Luke Broadhurst is even back. And so that's a lot of both production that they're returning and also what I think is invaluable is experience. Um, these are guys that know how to win. They know how to get to a tournament. Um, and, and I think that they're, that is a, a nice duo trio rather to have, um, as your core offensively. And then one guy who I think is in line for a big step forward is infielder, Ryan Daniels. Uh, he'll be an everyday player on the dirt this spring. Um, he had a solid freshman season last year in which he, I think he hit over 270 with 11 or so extra base hits and 20 RBIs. He can swing it and he can pick it. And I think that he's going to be. I know that he is highly regarded within the program. And I think that this year is going to be kind of his coming out party of sorts where he takes that next, that next step forward really establishes and really establishes himself as a pro level prospect. Um, you mentioned him as a futures league guy. Um, he'll be playing on the Cape this summer. So I think that this will be a big sophomore year for him. Um, and then on the mound, they also get talent back. I, I think that rotation that will feature, Ian Cook, who took a little bit of a a step back last year as a sophomore, he he has had a really nice fall. Um, Garrett Coe, he's a pitch ability lefty. Um, he's only eighty four to eighty six with a mid seventies changeup, but again, he really knows how to pitch. Nothing he throws is super straight, and he does an excellent job of of staying off the barrel and avoiding hard contact. So I think that's a really valuable one two punch. And then Stephen Quigley as well. He's a really experienced guy. Came over from Wheaton. 
um, had a solid year last year. I think he had a 480 RA in the rotation and um, not 75 strikeouts in about as many innings pitch. So it's a solid rotation. It's a really solid core of offensive guys. And, you know, I, I think until they prove otherwise, it's going to be really difficult to bet against UConn um, staying at the top of the Big East and at the very least being super, super competitive within the Big East. And they're always going to be in the hunt for a tournament berth. Yeah, you mentioned UConn being kind of the transfer hub of the Northeast. Well, I think they were the first to kind of really dip into that um, transfer portal and get some high talented players. It's become more common, you know, over the last year or two. I, I know UMass, I think, brought in nine transfers. Um, Rhode Island brought in seven. So I think these state university, these state schools um, are kind of finding that as a if if maybe you're from Connecticut and you go to, you know, University of Michigan for a year and find that you don't have the role that you were expecting, it's, you know, you come back to your state school. UMass, I know, did that uh, with Mark Willie and a couple of those guys uh, who either went to Pitt or Michigan, some of these power five schools. And they said, you know what, we want to play. And uh, the offer of the in-state tuition kind of offsets any scholarship money you might have got somewhere else with only, you know, 11.7 scholarships per program. So, I think Jim Penders kind of discovered that route first and now everybody's doing it, but I agree. Um, I agree with Peter. I, I really like Ryan Daniels. I think this will be a big year for him. I think Mac, Mac Garbowski is kind of in the same boat behind the plate where he could emerge as a pro spot, pro prospect as a catcher and all the guys that he mentioned will provide a, a lot of production. And, and like he said, I wouldn't bet against UConn. I wouldn't bet against Jim Penders. I like them in the big East uh, to repeat this year. Yeah, and I am going to ask a question off script. I'm sorry, but I think you both can answer it uh, pretty well. Um, UConn has a couple of guys that went from Division Three to Division One. We mentioned Luke Broadhurst. He came from Eastern Connecticut. Jake Studley came from Wheaton. How valuable do you think that is in terms of the transfer portal and those guys getting those experiences in D1 or sorry, D3 before ending up at D1 schools? Yeah, I, I think it's hugely valuable. You mentioned those guys, and then they've also got another one who I think will be a um, a pretty big contributor for him. A, a key contributor this spring is Caleb Spur, who is um, transferring in from Endicott. Um, he's a spark plug outfielder. He can really run. He can really hit. Um, I I remember watching him a little bit at Endicott last year and really liked him a lot. And he was a Cape guy who came in at the end of the the twenty twenty two summer for Hyannis and. He only played five regular season games, I think, but I, I saw him in the playoffs and he's he's someone that whether you hit him at the top of the lineup or in the bottom third, that he can he can really be a, a provide a spark. And I think that he is someone that can contribute to the game in, in a multitude of ways. So he'll be a valuable piece for him. Um, and I think just get, getting experienced guys, um, those kind of slow heartbeat, steady Eddie type guys who 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 know what it takes for lack of better phrasing. Um, I, I think is, is hugely valuable because I, I, I'd put an experienced bunch up against anyone. Yeah. And it's just a good, uh, example for guys who are coming out of high school and maybe, um, it's so hard to project where guys are going to be in three or four years. So if you don't have that D one offer, you know, junior year of high school, it's okay. You know, it's, there's still a path for you to pro baseball, uh, as long as you work hard, like your development, not all high school programs are equal. Not all guys are in the same travel programs, getting the same looks. So, um, you know, go to college, work hard. And you see guys like, like you said, Gale, Caleb Spur, Gabe Van Iman, also a, a Endicott transfer. Um, they had great college careers at the D3 level. And now they have an opportunity to play at a school where guys get drafted every year, you know? So if they are able to have that level of production, I think it's a it's a safer bet for a guy like uh, Coach Penders and Coach McDonald at uh, UConn to say this guy you know hit almost 400 two years in a row at the D3 level. I know he's going to be productive here. Whereas you know high school juniors, high school seniors, they've got a long way to go to develop to play at that level. And uh, Coach Penders has said you know he learned when they were in the American uh, Conference that it, you, it's hard to win with freshmen. So. Um, you know, I, it, there's nothing wrong with going that D3 route and, and there are no doors that are closed to you just because you don't get a D1 scholarship. 
Yeah, and we talked about all those schools, UConn, BC, Northeastern, but there's plenty of other New England schools we can touch on. Dean Ferreira, our Futures League MVP from last year, was is at Fairfield. Sean Matson at Harford. Harvard. Uh, we got a couple of guys at Central Connecticut. What New England schools, maybe one or two, that you guys are excited about, other than the ones that we've named heading into this uh, season? Yeah, I, I think I'm particularly excited about Harvard. Um, they're always really competitive in the Ivy League, and, and this year they, again, boast a pretty strong roster. I'm particularly excited about that pitching staff, and it's got two Futures League alums and two Vermont Lake Monster, Monsters alums in Sean Matson and Callan Fang. Um, Sean Matson had a ridiculous summer in 2022. I think he had a 68-5 to five strikeout-to-walk ratio with a 1-6 ERA. And he had a spotless summer um, with Orleans last year on the Cape. He had a zero ERA with 26 Ks in, in 21 and two-thirds innings pitched. Low 90s fastball, changeup is without a doubt a plus pitch, slider flashed. I like him a lot. Callan Fang had a, a similar summer to what Sean Matson did in his time in Vermont. He had a 1-1 ERA with 45 strikeouts to just eight walks and 23 and, a, and two-thirds innings pitched. He is very much on the mats and path and he's going to pitch for Orleans this summer in the Cape league. But um, that's a really uh, that's a, that's a pretty vaunted duo to have on your pitching staff. They get Tanner Smith back um, who I believe pitched for the Worcester Bravehearts. Um, I, I might be wrong there, but um, or at the very least he was signed to pitch for the Worcester Bravehearts, but he's back and fully healthy. And they also have Jake Berger, who I think had a stint with the North shore navigators. Um, ben, Ben rounds is a really good player. And then Gio Colasante is, um, I mean, he's got a big league body at 6'5", 200. He's got a big time arm across the infield. If he can put it together at the plate, um, that's going to be huge. So they're going to be a really, really strong team. Um, the Ivy League, I think, is a very underrated conference, especially up in this neck of the woods with, you know, you have Harvard, Columbia, Penn, um, Princeton. I think those are kind of the big four. Um, but I, I'm, I'm excited about Harvard and think they'll be really competitive in the Ivy. Yeah, I'm going to go with two obvious ones that um, we haven't talked about yet, but I feel like we should give them some love because they both qualified for NCAA regionals last year. But Maine is, I like the way that program's ha- uh, going right now with Nick Durba now in his eighth season. Um, they were at the Coral Gables regional last year. They were won the America East and they have uh, America East player of the year, Jeremiah Jenkins back. They seem to get guys drafted every year. I know Nick Senecola a few years ago was a main guy. Quinn McDaniel last year was, I think he might have been like a fourth or fifth round pick. He ended up getting drafted pretty high. Um, so they they always are, are very impressive. And then Central Connecticut State, I think we need to mention too. Charlie Hickey now in his 25th year just churns out winning teams every every season. They went to the Columbia Regional last year and they have a lot of guys back. Uh, Hunter Pasqualini, I believe, is a Futures League alum. Um, and then they have, you know, a, a lot of really good players. I, li- I like uh, where the program is going with Charlie Hickey, and you always you can't count those guys out, so I think they deserve mention too. But, yeah, I'd, I'd go with Maine and Central Connecticut as the two that I'm kind of watching beyond those three that uh, we mentioned with BC, Northeastern, and UConn. Yeah, certainly some teams to look out for, and all New England teams are really excited Uh, about all of them heading into the 2024 season here. And we also had some guys named two All-American teams, including some former Futures Leaguers, uh, Ethan Anderson and a couple of New England guys and Jonathan Santucci and Kalen Culpepper. What have you seen from those guys and what makes them All-Americans? Yeah, so at least speaking for how we do it at Baseball America, I think it's pretty unique in that our All-American teams are decided and voted on by scouting directors. So it's a a little bit of a peek into how highly regarded those guys are within the industry um, and speaks to the level of prospect that they are heading into the spring. But Anderson, for me, is one of the premier college bats in this year's draft. He's got a lengthy track record of production. And he hit 427 in the Futures League, I think, with Vermont as a – and, Dan, you mentioned it before, uh, earlier in the show, but he hit 427 as a high school senior incoming college freshman in the Futures League. Um, and then he carved out an everyday role for himself as a true freshman at Virginia. And then last year he kind of broke out where he had 375 with 26 doubles, 15 home runs, and, and 66 RBIs. And he earned a, an invite to the Team USA um, training camp. And then he's – Switch hitter, uh, I, 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 he's got power from both sides, a little bit more power from the left-hand side, 
He's got really advanced barrel awareness and bat to ball skills. Um, he's super, super tough to beat with the with a fastball. Um, and then last year he had a 91% in zone contact rate. And then going back to how hard it is to beat him with a heater, it was 95% against fastballs, and he hit almost 400 against fastballs, 92 plus. So um, I think defensively is a little bit more of a question mark. He could end up um, behind the he he'll be the everyday catcher I think this year for Virginia. Um, but there is a chance he ends up moving back to first base as a pro where I think he can really pick it and he moves well around the bag. So the bat's the carrying tool for Anderson, but I like him a lot. And then Santucci, you've got an athletic left-hander, your pizza's delivery well. I think he's got a chance for maybe three plus or better pitches. He's got a fastball up to 96 with a ton of ride through the zone. Um, and he's got a sharp low 80 slider that last year had a miss rate over 50% really tight two plane break with some vertical depth at times. And then he's got a high eighties changeup that he also flashes. Um, and it profiles, I think is a potential plus pitch with, he's got a ton of late drop and tumbling action. And then lastly with Culpepper, there's, there's a lot of strength and athleticism packed into his frame. Um, he was excellent last year at K state. Um, and he got an invitation to team USA. He made the final roster and, he excelled for him and was one of their standout performers. I think he hit 390 with a double, two triples, three home runs, and 10 RBIs. He's another guy like Anderson. He's got really advanced feel for the barrel and plus bat to ball skills. Um, I He's an outstanding athlete. And last year he played third base for K-State with Nick Goodwin, who was a seventh round draft pick, I believe, by the Toronto Blue Jays, um, holding down shortstop. But he'll slide to shortstop, Culpepper will, this spring. Um, and that's where he played every day this summer for Harwich in the Cape League. And I really liked how he looked at shortstop. He's got smooth actions. He does a really nice job of working around the baseball. And it's a legit plus arm, both from short and third. So he's a guy who's going to stick on the left side of the infield professionally. And I think with especially Culpepper and Santucci, you have two guys with with no doubt first round upside. And I think Anderson um, is more of a, a second to third round pick. But all three certainly are in a very good spot to be selected on day one of the draft. Yeah. I don't have much to add on those scouting reports. Those were pretty thorough, but um, I will say I saw Jonathan, Jonathan Santucci back in 2020. He was at Phillips Andover at the time. Uh, and I think it was like an area code games tryout and they were scrimmaging, I think Brockton or um, yeah, somebody back then. But I remember I was like super impressed with Santucci. He played the first like six innings of the game. I think, I mean, he might have played first base or you know outfield somewhere but he was hit, you know he was driving the ball and I was like hey this kid's a prospect all of a sudden the a seventh inning they call him you know to take the mound he takes him down the first pitch is like 92 and I was like who is this kid he's just ridiculous uh, but that was my first impression of uh, Jonathan Santucci and he's been impressive ever since Hold on, we'll get right back to Back to the Futures, but first, we want to share a message from our friends at 78 Sports. Do you have kids playing baseball or softball? We all know practice time is limited, especially here in New England, not to mention the cost of lessons and cage time can add up very quickly. Save yourself time and money by giving your kids what they need to work on their game at home. Our friends at 78 Sports can help you put together the perfect at-home training setup. Whether you want to start small with just a tee and a net, or looking to set up a full cage with turf and a pitching machine, they have you covered. And I've used their stuff before. I've seen their facilities. They definitely cover everything. The team at 78 Sports design and install hundreds of at-home and commercial sports training facilities. So let them help you find the perfect setup for your space. Visit the 78 Sports website at 78sports.com. That's S-E-V-E-N-T-Y, the number eight, sports.com. For a limited time only, by just mentioning Back to the Futures, you'll receive a 10% discount off your order. That's S-E-V-E-N-T-Y, number eight, sports.com. Now, back to your regularly scheduled programming. So yeah, Santucci, Anderson, and Carl Pepper have, were excellent for the Futures League a couple of years ago. But let's go to last year where we had another set of players, another set of award winners, and two more top pro prospects in Will Fosberg and Dylan V, who were exceptional last year. What have you two seen from the two of them in high school and this past summer? And what do you how do you believe they will fare in college? Yeah, at least starting with Dylan Vig, he was 
outstanding at the Groton School and the ISL last spring. He was a little bit of a, a pop-up guy in terms of on the draft cycle. Um, but he led the ISL with 71 strikeouts. And again, he was one of those high school seniors that really excelled and, and flourished in the Futures League. And he had a 2.56 ERA with 34 Ks to just 12 walks and 31 and two-thirds innings, as you mentioned. He was the league's top pro pitching prospect. He was also an all-star. Um, he kind of put himself squarely on almost every organization's draft board, but he opted to to take his talents to Ann Arbor. He's a really good athlete. His fastball has been in the 92 to 94 range up to a 95 with some run and sink. Um, and it, it, I think his best pitch is probably his mid 80s slider. It's got really sharp two plane break to it um, with some depth and sweep. And I think it's got the potential to be a plus pitch down the road. Um, and it's his go-to swing and miss out pitch, so to speak. And I, I think looking to this year, um, he's, he's going to be the Friday night starter for the Wolverines from the get-go. Um, and which is, I think that's a huge testament to his ability on the mound. Um, and I'm really excited to see how he does in the role. Yeah, he had, uh, he's had a really good, or he had a really good fall, obviously to earn that Friday, Friday night spot. Um, I think I just saw Peter Gammons uh, tweeting about him a week or two ago too. He's, he's, he's excited that he's going to get a chance to start on Fridays for, Michigan. Will Fosberg is a guy. Um, he's kind. He kind of had an unusual path through high school. Um, he went the prep route. I think freshman or sophomore year, he went to Wichenden, the Wichenden school, um, and played under Coach Toffee. And then once he got his commitment to Northeastern, he decided to go back to Natick High School uh, and just play with his his friends. You know, the guys he grew up playing baseball with in Little League, his high school friends. Um, so not, you know, there are people that thought maybe that wasn't going to be the most competitive way for him to handle his high school career, but then he went, uh, to the futures league last year, played for Nashua and just had a great summer. Like you said, futures league, top pro prospect. He batted three Oh one, uh, with a four thirty on base percentage. Uh, he played in 33 games. He looked the part of a, a contributor at Northeastern. So, um, and, and he's, he'll get innings for them behind the plate. I think this year he's a left-handed hitting catcher. Uh, those always, you know, those guys always have value in college lineups. Um, so, you know, he seemed to play his high school career the way that he wanted to do it. It worked out well for him. And I think he'll have a great career at Northeastern. Yeah, those two guys are certainly poised to jump on the scene with their college teams. And we're excited to see uh, what happens with them. We've talked a lot about the college game. Let's go to the professionals. And we're going to start with a very generic question. Who is the best talent that the both of you have seen come through the Futures League? That's a great question. I Dan will have me beat in terms of experience. So I'll probably go with someone that's more recent. Um, for me, it's hard not to say Sal Fralick, who's now at the big league club with the Brewers. Um, he was... Unbelievable, both in 2018 and 29 and 2020 um, with the Navigators. In 2018, he hit 360 with, uh, I think it was 15 extra base hits. And then in 2020, he hit almost 400 um, with a similar level of production in only 24 games. Um, he showed and flashed five tool upside during his time there, and he's already... Um, He's already been reasonably productive at the major league level with Milwaukee. So for me, it's, it's hard to not say Sal Freilich. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I probably have to go Sal too, uh, just to give you a couple other guys that really stood out. Uh, well, Reggie Crawford played in the futures league in 2020. And um, I just remember being kind of blown away with him uh, coming off. I think, yeah. So he had a great year at UConn, I think in 20. 2019 and then he ended up having the tj surgery after that but he could be a two-way you know pro prospect he was really good and then like you know there was ben kasparius nick sinicola those guys um were great in the futures league and may have uh big league futures ahead of them uh and then dennis collar is a guy he was on the in the futures league wasn't he back in the futures league for a couple of weeks last summer coming off his tj surgery before he went to the cape so he's been there a couple times it was one of those situations last summer where like, you know, he gets on the mound after a long layoff after the TJ surgery and it's like 97, 98. And you're like, wait a minute, this, maybe he should be on the Cape. And he ended up there pretty quickly, but um, he's been a good guy. To, I, I love watching Dennis Collar and pitch. He just goes after guys and throws hard and 
he's one of my favorite guys uh, going into this year's draft. Yeah, we caught Colorado on the podcast just before he went to the Cape. I'm pretty sure it was like two days before. He went, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Um, he's been great. And you both mentioned Sal Frelick, who was unbelievable in the Futures League and has had an incredible start to his career in Milwaukee. Even before he was, you know, on the radar when it was a younger guy at BC, what did you guys see in him? And what's it like to see his growth and his development to now be playing for the Brewers, not only on their team, but hitting very, very high in the lineup in the playoffs? I mean, even going back to his time at Lexington High, I'm about a, a similar age as Sal. I think I'm a year or so older than he is. Um, but he was always highly regarded just as an a, a sick athlete. Obviously, baseball was his best sport, but he was an unbelievable football player. I think he was the Mass Gatorade Player of the Year for football, and he was also a standout hockey player. And he was known around the area and just in high school sports circles, at least in New England, as just this stud athlete. And I think that that also best describes him on the baseball field. He's an outstanding athlete. It's it's clear he plays the game at one speed. He loves to play. Um, I alluded to it when talking about him in the Futures League, but um, in college, I mean, he he did it all for the Eagles, and he did it all in the Futures League. Um, he hit for average. He had a little bit of pop, um, was an outstanding defender in center field where his baseball sense and instincts really shine, could really run. And then he that that's translated both – through the pro ranks and then also up um, into the major league club where he's flashed that outstanding defensive skill set. Um, and it's clear in, in just watching him play that, that he loves the game. And you can't really say that about everyone. And I think that's a quality you either have or you don't. And and Sal definitely has it. And I think that it only adds to, to kind of the special player that he is. And I'm looking forward to hopefully uh, watch him for a really long time in the major leagues. Yeah, I think with Sal, any evaluation has to start with the athleticism, you know, three sport stud, you know, maybe one of the best players in the state at all three sports. Uh, he played shortstop at Lexington High. I know late in his career, I remember seeing him at shortstop. Um, and it was just, you know, the the thing that really stands out about him, uh, because of his athleticism, he always has the ability to make these highlight reel plays or, you know, the way he runs the bases or the way that, he, you know, he's laying out for fly balls in the outfield or crashing into the wall. And the crazy thing about him is it just continues at every level that, you know, you might be like, oh, he's a little undersized. He's probably a little short to drive the ball. But the same highlights that he was making, you know, in high school and then at BC, you're watching Sports Center last year and you're like, man, another Sal. That's <laughs> amazing how many highlights the guy had in like a pretty short season. Um, you know, he got the late call up and then, you know, he was in the playoffs. But I think the Brewers realize what they have. And I, I do think we are going to be watching highlights of him for a long time. Yeah, his debut was too defensive like he flashed his glove within the first 10 minutes of him being i know team. yeah yeah he's a great player yeah that's a testament to who sal is as a player for sure and we mentioned sal who is a guy that's in the major leagues but there's a couple of guys a couple of great prospects from the futures league that aren't in the majors yet who are the best prospects from new england from the futures league not in the majors yet I think the the two that stick out to me are uh, Matt Shaw with the Chicago Cubs and then Ben Rice with the Yankees. And and Matt Shaw was a first-round draft pick, 13th overall this past year by the Cubs, and he excelled in his first year of professional baseball. He sent it all the way to the AA level with Tennessee where he won a Southern League championship with Coach Kevin Graber, who was the former head coach at, at Phillips Andover. Um, but in his – First professional season, he had 357 with nine doubles, eight home runs, 28 RBIs, and 15 stolen bases in just 38 games. And it it's a really minuscule sample size, um, but it, it is a great snapshot of his skill set. And he's a guy that, you know, he can do it all. He, to me, he's kind of the definition of a baseball rat. Um, he can really swing it. He can drive the ball with authority, but the hit tool is also really advanced. He can run. Um, I think he's a second baseman long-term defensively, but that's really not a wart on the overall profile. Um, and I think that he's someone that you're also going to see in the major league sooner rather than later. Um, I, I think 2025 is most realistic, but I wouldn't totally rule out a, a 2024 call up. And then with Ben Rice, he was someone that won, I think MVP with Worcester in 2019. Um, 
and he was he was a later round draft pick of the Yankees in 2021, day three guy who got selected in the 12th round. Um, and then this year was kind of his 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 coming out party, um, especially in in double A Somerset, where in 45 games he had 327 with 13 doubles and 16 home runs and 48 RBIs. It's obviously big time left handed power, especially the pull side. But I've been most encouraged and and most happy to see how the catching skills have come along. I think that was the one question mark with him going into the draft was, um, you know, if he would stick at the catcher spot or if he'd have to move off it maybe to first base or even to left field. But um, he's proven his worth behind the dish and his his defensive skill set continues to progress really nicely. So I think similar to Shaw, you're looking at 2025, but I, I really wouldn't rule out a 2024 call up for either of these guys. Yeah, you asked about the importance of uh, summer collegiate baseball, and Ben Rice is like a great example of a guy who hadn't even gotten much of a shot at Dartmouth. Um, He definitely wasn't an everyday catcher and then came in and just dominated collegiate summer league ball, earning MVP. Um, He was like a pandemic guy that just took off and um, ended up getting drafted. Another one, uh, has Mickey Gasper made the big leagues yet? No. No, he has not. Yeah, he's another one who is like super productive in the Futures League. I always liked him at Bryant, um, another lefty catching. I don't know if he's still behind the plate, but he was he just hits like everywhere he goes. He hits. I know he was kind of working his way up through the minor leagues, um, but he's a guy I'm surprised hasn't made the big leagues yet. Yeah, Gasper actually just joined the Red Sox organization from the Yankees. So a little. Oh, uh, did he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see that. Oh, that well, hopefully. Yeah, that'd be great if he makes it up here. Yeah, that would certainly be fun. And my next two questions were about Rice and Shaw, but I do want to kind of touch on them because it was incredible, especially what Ben Rice did in 2020. The Futures League was stacked. Only show in town. A bunch of prospects that we've talked about on the show already were there, and Rice comes away with the MVP. And then Shaw comes in the last week of the year and goes on a tear that we've never seen. He hit – it seemed like every time he came to the plate, he was doing – he was either hitting a home run – or doing something ex- extraordinary. It was incredible to watch. Yeah, you know yeah, who was no, another? They... Oh, go ahead. I was going to say another one that summer who um, kind of did the same thing. I remember seeing Dom Keegan, um, and he was coming off a couple of years at Vanderbilt, and you know how hard it is to carve out a, a spot in the Vanderbilt lineup anyway, but I think he had struggled through a couple of injuries, Um and just had not produced yet at Vanderbilt when he came in 2020. And I remember uh, seeing him, I think it was like a, that area code game scrimmage I was talking about. And he, and Colloran was on the mound throwing like, you know, 95 that summer and um, Ga- or no, um, Dom Keegan took him opposite field, like 400 feet. And I, I just remember being like, what is this guy doing? Like I looking at all his, profile and his stats and everything and it was just one of those guys that pops up in the summer and you're like I don't know what he's doing in the futures league but um you see that guys like that every summer that are legit pro prospects and you kind of carve out their way through the futures league so he's another one in 2020 who kind of took off during the pandemic then Peter you're gonna say something about Oh, no, I was just going to say, to Dan's point, uh, Ben Rice was a guy that, I mean, he dominated the Futures League in 19, but his coming out party was for sure that 2020 summer where, oh, and you said it, it was, I mean, I, I think at that point it was the best summer baseball in the country, and, and all eyes were on it, all evaluators were were coming in and watching the Futures League, so it was it was special to see him kind of establish himself as a pro prospect during that summer, and then also Shaw doing the same, albeit in a little bit of a smaller sample size, but all the 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 guys who would have probably played on, on the Cape or with Team USA um, in a normal year were in the Futures League. And so I think that while it was a, a crazy time in the world, it was one of the cooler and more special summers in the Futures League. Yeah, it was great to provide that comfort for people that there was a there was baseball in town. There was something happening after just a wild couple of months in the entire world. It was, it was great to, to have that special summer here in New England. Before we return to Back to the Futures, we want to share a message from our friends at Zorian Back Company. Rob Zorian started the company Zorian Back Company in 2003, literally out of the trunk of his car in Davie, Florida. Within two years, he was selling his wood bat line to Major League Baseball and continues to manufacture the highest grade wood bats for Little League all the way up to the majors. Rob Zorian, founder and president of Zorian, says... 
I started the company in 2003 to service all baseball players in the United States and beyond. And after 19 years, our mission has not changed. We are very excited to have the opportunity to work with the Futures League and wish all of our players and coaches a healthy and successful season ahead. For more information about Zorian, visit their website, ZorianBats.com. Zorian, America's baseball brand. Now, back to Back to the Futures. And transitioning kind of off of the baseball side of it to you guys, to the media coverage. You know, it's it's great to have media covering media here. This is, is pretty rare. But I want to ask, what has covering base summer baseball specifically shown you guys about the sport of baseball in general? Yeah, I, I think it's a, a really unique and, and up close look at so many high level players and you really get a peek into the person um, as in addition to the player, you obviously, I mean, you're, you're right on these guys watching them play, whether it's the futures league, the Cape league, wherever it is, you're, you're on top of them. But I think it's a really unique opportunity to get a glimpse into who they are um, beyond the baseball. And I think it it's baseball in its purest form. Um, while they still do take it really seriously, it's not the stress of the school season. Um, they're able to kind of exhale a little bit, really refine their skill set. And so I think it's baseball in a really pure form. And I think it's what makes so many of these leagues really special. Yeah, for me, it's just, you know, it's one more opportunity. I, I mentioned earlier, some of these guys don't maybe don't have the role that they hoped for on their college teams, or they're not getting uh, evaluated that the by as many scouts or as many, you know, coaches, recruiters as they would like. It just gives them one opportunity. It just shows you how hard it is to make it, you know, to pro baseball because you can slip kind of between the cracks and under the radar. And then all of a sudden, you know, these guys take off in the summer. We just mentioned, you know, guys like Ben Rice and Dom Keegan uh, who may not have had an opportunity to play pro baseball had it not been for summer collegiate league baseball. So it's just one more opportunity for guys to stand out. And, you know, it, it probably prevents more guys from slipping through the cracks who maybe don't, get the role that they want to play, you know, for their college teams. Yeah. It's great to be able to cover these guys. And I do want to ask that question too. How important do you believe it is for these players to receive the media coverage that you guys are providing that we provide that, you know, other outlets provide them? Yeah, I I think it's super important. And then I, I think above all else that their play on the field is going to do all the talking. So, I mean, if you're a good player, whether you're, a high level D one guy or, or a sleeper D three guy. Um, if you're good and you can play, um, people will find you, evaluators will find you. So, um, I think that, you know, social media nowadays is such a powerful tool. And I, I know I can speak from experience when, you know, following the futures league Twitter account that I've been tipped off to guys who've been performing really well, um, and who I've put on my radar. And I know that scouts can say the same. So I think that it's, it's super, super important for the players. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, I had just mentioned how hard it is in baseball and it's such a sport of failure and, you know, people have friends and family who know how hard you're working when you're trying to, you have that goal of making it to professional baseball. Um, and maybe they don't, you know, get to see, Oh, here's, here's how well they're doing in summer baseball. So it is nice to kind of highlight some of these performances when all the hard work goes into it for guys who maybe max out at the college level. But then also, like Peter said, um, sometimes, you know, I have had scouts reach out to me and say, Hey, can you send me like a watch list of guys that I need to see this summer in the futures league or guys that I should take a look at on the Cape and you send them to them and they're not going to, I don't think they're going to trust my evaluation and say, I don't even need to look at this guy, you know, but they, at least it gives them, you know, 30, 40 guys that say, Oh, these three weren't on my list. Let me go check them out and see if you're way off. Or maybe, maybe I just didn't know about this guy and I'm going to have him on my radar from now on. Yeah. That's great that you guys are able to provide that coverage and, you know, provide that opinion for scouts. Even if you said it, even if they're not really reading it, it's good that they're asking you about it and that, you know, your opinion is getting to them. And when you guys sit down and interview players, I know that some people, some players have a certain comfort level that others do not, but are there certain expectations that you have for the players when they sit down for interviews? Um, I, I just kind of talk to them and, and try and keep it as relaxed as possible. Um, I'm really lucky to have personal relationships with a lot of guys in, in college and professional baseball right now. Um, being of similar age, I, I just, 
you know, talk to him and keep it as conversational as possible. I don't really like to stick any expectations on him or, or expect anything out of him. So I think keeping it relaxed um, is both helpful for myself and then also helps them maybe open up a little bit more. Yeah, for me and uh, oh, and you probably have experienced this too. It's there. It's two different things. Like if you're uh, if you're at a game and you're just pulling a guy aside and chatting with him, you know, in an interview after a game or you know even a workout or something like that, uh, there aren't many expectations there. It's just you're hoping to get something interesting out of him and maybe um, you know something to follow up on with a story or um, any you know maybe they'll tip you off with something else that's going on with the team that you need to look into, but. Um, podcasting is different i feel and you i'm sure you've experienced this sometimes where uh then the expectation is like hey we're not going to curse on on this podcast we don't do that or it might be like hey um i've had podcasts where you stop them after five minutes and you're like hey can you do me a favor we're trying to go you know 45 minutes to an hour on this thing can you be a little more expansive with your answers because you know, sometimes either they're nervous or they're trying to be too cool and they'll give you kind of the like, hey, do you ever get nervous out there when you're playing? It's like, no. And it's like, all right, well, we're going to we we need 45 minutes here. So can we can we expand on that a little bit? Um, but yeah, uh, for the most part, I haven't had any problems interviewing uh, athletes. And you kind of usually you, you try to vet it a little bit before you bring them onto the podcast. You'll talk to their coach and just be like, how is this guy? you know, in an interview, is he pretty shy? You know, maybe the 45 minutes doesn't work for him, which is fine too. It's not like, you know, his draft stock plummets because he can't do a podcast for 45 minutes, but uh, for the, for the purposes of entertaining an audience, you'll be like, ah, maybe I'll go with somebody else this week. Yeah. I mean, it's true. And we will, we've had a, you know, a variety of different players over the years on this podcast. And like, some of them love to talk. Some of them are definitely a little bit more timid when they come on, but it's it's good to get those different you know perspectives though because you never know what you're going to get from everybody. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Gentlemen, this has been fantastic so far. I have one final question for you both, and it's a doozy. What is the best story that you both have done in your professional journalism careers? Oh man, I when you saw that when you sent me that question or when it was on the list of questions, it was it actually was surprisingly really easy for me to think of. Um, but. It would have to be one of the first stories I did at Baseball America last year, um, and it was discussing Wake Forest and and kind of you know last year was the the first season in which they had these sky high expectations, Omaha aspirations, um, and they kind of had a target on their back. And so I got to talk to head coach Tom Walter for a little while about his team, um, read a really cool and in depth profile on them and how they're they're managing expectations both internally. Um, and also externally, and it was a, a special story in and of itself. But I think what was the what the cherry on top was them eventually making it to the College World Series and getting to to see them compete in person in Omaha. So um, I think that was that's without a doubt the favorite my favorite story I've written so far. Yeah, for me, uh, the best story was probably um, I did a story a few years ago on Ryan Westmoreland, who was a Red Sox prospect who um, ended up. His career ended at an early age. I think I want. It was a brain. I I can't remember it off the top of my head, but you know he had. Um, I think he had a stroke or you know some type of brain damage, um, and it was just an inspiring story. Like his attitude moving forward from that, because he was a really high draft pick and a really highly ranked Red Sox prospect who probably had a long career ahead of him. And he had that taken away, but still had an attitude of he wants to inspire people. He wants to um, kind of be an example for people who are dealt, you know, really intense adversity in their lives and still try to make the most of it. So um, it wasn't anything I did in writing it or I think I also had a podcast with him. It was just, you know, I was inspired by him um, and, you know, it continued to be inspired by him. So that was probably the best story that I've covered. Yeah, that's awesome. And, you know, you, you kind of both just said it. There's so many different angles of stories that you can write. You never know, you know, which one is going to impact you in which way. And that was that was two great answers. I couldn't ask for two better ones. I appreciate God. that. Yeah, of course. This has been fantastic. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Best of luck moving forward. And, hey, happy baseball season. We made it. Right on. <laughs> Thanks Thank so you, much, Owen. Happy baseball season. Of course. 
This has been Season 8, Episode 8 of Back to the Futures, the official podcast of the Futures League. We have new episodes coming out all throughout the offseason. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see everyone soon.